All right. Uh, thanks a lot for, for including me. Uh, this is a paper that I think is, so apologies for those people who've seen some early version of it. It's been around for a while. Uh, that's with John that you all know, with uh, Nilsson Darasan, who used to be at eBay, now at Microsoft, and Chiara Foronato, who just started at uh, HBS. And, and kind of the thing that triggered us to write this paper is, is this graph, more or less. Is, this is the, the share, so, so this is all data from eBay, and the line is basically the share of stuff on eBay that goes through kind of auction relative to some version of fixed prices. And you know, the early days of eBay, when they started in the late 90s, it was only auction, it was the auction site. And then in the middle of 2002, they introduced kind of the possibility to list, price, to list items for sale as something like a fixed price. Uh, and, and this is basically, initially of course, kind of most of the stuff was still an auction, but as you see sort of, you know, either in revenue terms or for active listing terms or other me metrics, it's really kind of a big kind of trend downwards. And actually if you push it kind of three years forward, it keeps going but kind of plateaus at some kind of low, relatively low, low level. And it's not a unique thing about, about eBay. If you go to Google Trends and kind of, you know, try to kind of do like Google Trends for online auction versus online prices, it's all indexes, so who knows what the, the level means. But the relative thing is meaningful, and, and what you, you see something that's qualitatively very similar, more generally outside of eBay, there's sort of less interest uh, in online auction over time. And kind of online prices is kind of, you know, relative, at least relative to, to online prices. So, so what, you know, what this paper is trying to do, are kind of two related points here. One is just kind of more in a, in a cross section, try to think about the trade-offs in a very simple price theory model, if you want, uh, 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 the, 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 the trade-offs between listing an item for sale from a seller perspective as a fixed price versus sort of auction. And, and then sort of, you know, with, the, with this kind of, in mind, kind of think about what might have led kind of to this kind of, you know, time trend decline in, in, in auctions on, on the internet. And I think as many of you probably know, this, this paper is, is kind of part of, a, of a several papers that we wrote using this kind of, you know, eBay data access collaboration. And, and kind of in the back of our mind, and I think it will come up kind of a little bit in the talk, there are like two aspects to, to this data collaboration. One was just, you know, use eBay not to study eBay as much, but to study sort of slightly things that are kind of more general, but can tell us something about e-commerce and online behavior and, and so forth. And the other stuff is kind of a big data type of motivation of, of who knows what big data means, but, but, but basically with this kind of highly unstructured and, and how to kind of, you know, rectangularize type of data set that you just get like a dump of all the things that happen on eBay sort of over kind of 10 years, it, kind of to come up with kind of strategies that are going to be scalable enough that you can use to kind of study this type of kind of, you know, you know, big and unstructured kind of type of data set. So that would come up uh, later. Uh, <coughs> so, so when you start thinking about, you know, what caused the decline to, to, auction, to online auctions, our first kind of thinking was like, it must be that to some extent, on compositional change. The early guys that were on eBay were kind of these fanatics. The, the current guys on eBay are mostly regular or more regular people, the old item, the first item on eBay that was sold was like a broken laser pointer. Uh, and, and in general, the, the early items on eBay were all this kind of unique type of used baby stuff and things like that. If you look at eBay today, it's becoming much more of like a little Amazon. Like the typical product on eBay is, or the typical seller on eBay is a guy who has like basically a small business, is buying stuff in China for cheap, and is selling them through eBay and potentially other platforms kind of to the American customers. So it becomes much more of a commoditized product. So that's another reason that might be, so if either the type of people or the type of product that are being sold on eBay might explain the, this decline. So I'm going to go quickly given time, but so, so in the cross section, it kind of makes everything make sense. So if you look at the occasional sellers, they are much more likely, likely to sell uh, <coughs> in auction. The business sellers, eBay classification, they are much less likely to sell in auction. Um, items that are used, which might be kind of more unique, are more likely to go on auction. Items that are kind of new are, are less likely to go on auction. But if you look at kind of the, can this explain the, the time trend? The, the answer is mostly no. So, so this is a quick, I'm not going to get you through the details. What we try to do is just do a simple decomposition. How much of the share, but now it's just for data constraint from 05 to 09 declining or increasing fixed price kind of share. You know, how much of it can be explained by shifting kind of the composition of items across either seller categories or, or item categories. 
very little is, is the cross kind of uh, item, category, uh, item categories, very little across seller categories, and, and everything is basically sort of within a, a seller type kind of item category type pair. So, so, so it's not that we are shifting kind of from baby items to kind of to electronics, and electronics are more fixed price and baby items are more auctions, and now we see more of the electronics getting transacted. Almost all the action is kind of within these fairly narrowly defined pairs. Uh, and the other way to see some version of what I just said, look at uh, this picture. We define a, a seller cohort as kind of the, as a seller you're defined as being part of a cohort if this is the first year that you ever sort of sold something on eBay. Uh, and for each cohort, we, so each line here represents like a cohort of these guys are the guys who were around kind of in 01 or before. These are the guys that their first transaction on eBay are like in 02 uh, and 03 and so forth. And, and on the y-axis is, is basically the share of, 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 of sales that you have in a given year that is kind of fixed price. And if there was all compositional effects, sort of in the, an extreme version, you should just see a bunch of flat lines. Like the early guys are kind of mostly doing auctions, the later guys are doing less auctions and so forth. But what you see is that, you know, as a new guy on eBay, you're, you're doing less, you're doing sort of more auctions and less eBay. Presumably you don't know how to price stuff. But within two years, everybody kind of line up with like the thing as a whole. So, so, so it's really more of a within seller type or seller cohort kind of time trend rather than some sort of compositional thing. And actually it's kind of interesting, you see very parallel picture on the buyer side. So you can define buyer cohorts kind of in a similar way. And, and the early buyers, so when you are just in coming to eBay as a buyer, probably you don't know how to bid. So it's like a little bit of a tendency to be more like buying in a, in a fixed price. But within a year, you're kind of lining up with like the platform kind of average as a whole. So, so the, like the compositional aspect seems to be not, not a huge deal. So kind of, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to completely ignore, in some sense, the compositional story and, 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 and mostly focus on two other stories that, that we are going to try to, to some extent, horse race or kind of or decompose uh, the overall decline. The, and basically, the, these are going to be, so we'll have two, a really simple model with really two simple parameters. One way to think about them, and that's like words that come, you know, one is competition. The idea is that, you know, Amazon was small in the late 90s and is bigger today. Or the other kind of, you know, way to transact kind of on the internet is higher. So overall competition is higher. So that makes basically, as you'll see in a second in the, in the, in the simple model, more competition makes kind of for, for lower price margin and, and less price discovery incentives. And that is shifting sort of from, from, online, from auctions to, to fixed prices. The other story is, is basically relative demand story is just some version of like extra utility or extra, or extra hassle of doing auctions. In the early days, kind of going for, going for auction was part of, a, of an experience. Maybe you got some adrenaline rush from kind of bidding and winning or losing. It was kind of new. And, and today, sort of, you, you know, it's a story that, well, you just want to transact. You don't want, you, you come in, you want to get some sort of anniversary type of present. It's not about the bidding in the auction. You want to come in and kind of buy it. And so, 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 if, so, so basically, the relative demand for auction is, is actually in decline. And we are going to try to horse race these two stories in, in, a, in a way that I'll show you in a sec. So that's basically the, the, the rest of the paper. So, so it goes through quickly the model. It's really simple. So, so think of a, <coughs> of a single seller for a second uh, with n potential buyers. Cost for the item is C. Think of this opportunity cost of selling it elsewhere or, or, or selling it later or anything like that. Uh, for simplicity, it's not that important. Everybody has the same value. So, so you have to work with enough bidders, basically, or with two bidders, it's, you know, they're going to kind of bid things up on the auction side kind of to the value. There wouldn't be any kind of auction kind of type kind of stories. Uh, buyers have kind of, you know, common reservation utility U. And there is like a utility loss or hustle cost of lambda from kind of going to the auction. So this would end up to be sort of the two parameters. U is going to be something like capturing the competition kind of story from the previous slide. And lambda is going to be capturing the relative demand kind of force uh, from the previous slide. And from a seller perspective, you have basically two decisions. So, so your first decision is like, how do I list it? I have an item, I want to sell it. You know, do I list it as a fixed price or as, a, as an auction? If I'm listing it as a fixed price, I need to pick a price. 
if, and, and then, you know, hope that kind of it sells. And, and if I sell it as an auction, I want to pick a reserve price or a start price and then kind of let the auction run and either I sell it or not with some sort of uncertainty about the price I'm getting, given that sort of I don't know the, the buyer valuation. So that's basically the, the simple model. What it, what it leads to, so this is like a, a way to illustrate the model uh, with a uniform sort of uh, valuation distribution. So this is the, f the regular fixed price demand curve. So, so it's kind of, you know, linear. It goes from, you know, with a price of, of one, you're not selling. With a price of zero, you're selling for sure. Uh, so this is the, pr the, the price and this is the probability of selling, of selling the item. Uh, what happens to, to auctions? And, and these are important because we later do the, the analogs to that. So the first cr curve is, 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 is an auction sales curve. So what I'm plotting here is the probability of sale kind of on the, on the x-axis and the, <coughs> and the auction sort of start price on, on, on the, on the, on the, on the y-axis. So here basically putting in lambda is equal to 0.2. So there's like a 20% hassle cost of participating in the auction. So if you're listing the item at more than 0.8, basically you're not selling because nobody values it. Well, once you start there, then you get the regular kind of demand curve. And, and the probability of sale is linear given the assumptions in the, in the, in the start price. And the, and the vertical difference is basically this hustle cost parameter lambda. Now, from a seller perspective, you don't quite care about this type of thing because what you really care is you, you really care about the, the trade-off between probability of sale and kind of the expected price you are getting, not the start price you are setting. So the auction demand curve is actually this one. And what this curve is basically saying, well, if I'm, set, you know, if I'm setting sort of say start price of 0.2, then with probability 0.6, I'm basically selling the item, but given that I'm selling it, then the expected price I expect to get on the item is actually going to be the, 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 the conditional and average of kind of bidders kind of being above 0.2. And because the auction is going to let people kind of bid it up. So, so, so you get, so, so in some sense, the, the, relative, the relative auction demand curve, which is the one that you want to compare to the, to the regular fixed price demand curve, is the auction demand curve, which is basically is, is in, the f in a price quantity kind of spectrum rather than like the start price quantity uh, uh, dimension. So that's, and then if you look at this, then you say like, what do I want to do? Then, you know, when I, when I basically really want to make sure I get kind of, you know, high price, then the best thing is to actually not rely on the auction, but kind of go for the fixed price. But when I really want to make sure that I want to sell, suppose my incentive is that I have like low opportunity costs, I really want to sell the item. If I really want to guarantee a, a high level of sell probability with a fixed price, the only way I can do it is kind of by really going the, taking the price really low. With auction, I set the start price really low to make sure I sell it, but then the auction is going to let people kind of bid it up, so my expected price is going to be higher. So, so kind of in this range, you're going to be basically going for auctions when kind of mostly picking quantity, high quantity. This range, you want to kind of go for, for posted price. And what, what the two forces here that I mentioned before, lambda, what lambda is going to do, lambda is going to be basically shift the, the, the auction demand curve kind of lower. So as the, the auction demand curve is shifting lower, uh, then the, the, the range in which you want to do posted prices is, is becoming higher, so you want to do this. What you, or the, the competition is going to do, is going to shift both curves kind of lower and at that point, sort of, because the auction demand curve is the one that is going to kind of hit kind of the, the x-axis first at some level, then again you get the same type of kind of pattern of kind of, you know, as U is increasing, opportunity cost of getting the item somewhere else, you know, then the, 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 the incentive to go kind of, you know, fixed prices uh, is going to, on average, uh, going up. So, so that's basically the, the, the theoretical framework we're going to use for that. So how do we operationalize this? It's not a perfect sort of research design, but it's something which is like test enough to kind of feel comfortable with and, and, and it's highly scalable. I think that's the main, you can easily kind of use it across many categories over time and, and things like that. And basic idea is that if this is a, this is a regular search result on eBay, you, this one is searching for basically tailor-made tailor driver, like a golf club. If you wanted to compare prices or auction versus fixed price across these kind of categories, which is already fairly narrowly defined, you still get like huge heterogeneity in the picture, in the way the listing, in the reputation of the sellers, and, and the listed price, like 400 bucks to 300 bucks. The, the research strategy here is, is basically to, to really compare identical items that are being listed on eBay 
either over time or at the same time by the same seller. Our way to do it is think of this kind of in a very simple way. Think of taking all the millions of listings that are on eBay, kind of say in a given year, just sorting them by the seller ID the, the, and, and the full kind of text that comes with the, with the listing. So basically you get a, 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 this type of thing. Nobody is searching for this. So nobody, this is like a picture that nobody who is buying on eBay is going to ever see because typically you're going to search for something like that and get these things kind of scattered around across, you know, 50 pages. Uh, but, but in principle, you could find many of those and then our main strategy is going to, exp to kind of run a big fixed effect regression where we are kind of using kind of within, within item, very specific item and seller variation uh, in either what, so one is like, do they list the same item as a fixed price or as an auction? And then within a fixed price or within an auction, what is the variation in the fixed price they are setting and the variation in the start price they are setting? Uh, to operationalize, we start with like, you know, the universe of eBay listings. We group listings, by, by, as, as I said. And, and one thing I should say, we are obviously selecting on the, on the non-unique stuff because the only way to get this variation is to not have the used baby item that I, I have only one unit of and, and sell it. It turns out that this is not a huge selective, at least for the eBay kind of, you know, spectrum is, is like more than, more than half the items, about two thirds of the items are part of what we would call like a duplicate or like a match listing. So, 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 so we are leaving away a little bit the, the less professional sellers or, buying the, or, or selling the, the unique items, but, but most part, this capture like two thirds of the listings. Uh, we have some data to make things kind of workable, the particular kind of question we are doing now, but the, the way you're, we are going to end up, we are going to construct this type of uh, uh, data sets year by year for 03 and 09. And we have some version for 05 and 07. And, and, and roughly, basically, we are talking about uh, 23,000 sets. So 23,000 items in 2003, 84,000 out times in, <coughs> in 2009, and on average, we're talking about, you know, fairly big sets. So, so these are kind of 50 to 70 sort of averaged items uh, in a set uh, for, for in each year. And you get a big variation, and you can restrict stuff in different, in, in different way. Uh, and and for, for most of what I'll show you, everything would be normalized by sort of the average price, because we are going to compare here like a huge, huge set of heterogeneous items from like things that are selling for like five bucks to things that are selling for a thousand bucks. Uh, uh, so, so for the most part, we'll just normalize everything by the average uh, transacted price. Uh, and, and it might come up later in the discussion. There are many good reasons to worry about this strategy. Why do, why do we see variation in the sellers? Why, is, why sometimes you sell as fixed price and, and, and auctions? We are doing some of it in the other paper, but in general, you, you, the nice thing about big data, I think on one hand, it's difficult to kind of have a clean research design and show that this is like, you know, across the board kind of bulletproof. On the other hand, you have many, you have enough data, you can kind of cut the data and cut the strategy in, in sufficiently many ways, not to make sure that it's kind of clean 100%, but to make sure that, you know, the most obvious concerns are not completely changing sort of the, the type of results. And, and we do a little bit in the paper, a little bit in, a, in an appendix, and a lot of it is sort of when we were kind of doing this. So, so, so we can, I can engage kind of uh, when things come up. Um, so let me show you some, some numbers. Uh, so this is, Think of this is all within within so so within match listings. Everything I'm going to show you, think of this as kind of running a big fixed effect regression. I'll show you, you know, the, the, it, it, so so for example, here is taking all the items listed in the PC category and just running a regression of what's the price that you're basically selling for as a fixed price versus the the, the, the and what's the price you're getting kind of. And, uh, sorry, this is the. The, what's the, the probability of selling for a fixed price listing of a PC and what's the probability of selling for an action? And you basically see, see qualitatively similar to what the model predicted is that basically the auctions are selling more for, for, for identical items. Uh, you, and you see the opposite on the price. So this is sort of the average sale price for the, for, for the process price, the average sales price for, for the auctions. And you see that on average, kind of category by category, kind of auctions are selling more, but kind of at lower expected price. Again, conditioning on the same set of, on the same set of items. If you look at the time trend, so this is basically asking for take two items, throw in the fixed effect. So we are comparing the same item. Some are kind of listed as fixed prices, some are listed as auctions. And you see that sort of auctions are kind of 
selling for less, so I just showed you this. But you know, in, in, if you go back to 2003, the, this, the auction discount that we, you know is like five percent. It's not huge. Um, so you know, I kind of skipped some of the slides from you know in the interest of time. But think of this: like if you look at the auction sale prices relative to the fixed price price, basically you see kind of a fairly kind of symmetric distribution around kind of the fixed price price. I mean, with some tilt to the left, but but basically uh, forty percent of the auction items are selling for for prices that are above the average fixed price for for the same item. If you push time forward, you go back to 2009, basically there are like huge increase in sort of the auction discount. Suddenly sort of an, on average, the same item is selling like for almost 20% lower kind of in auctions versus uh, fixed price. Uh, then finally, what we, so, so now we are moving to come closer to, the, to this curve that I showed you uh, in the model. So, so again, the strategy is the same. For a fixed price listing, it's really just estimating demand, assuming prices, kind of price variation within an item is, 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 is reasonably sort of, you know, good variation or identifying variation. So you estimate the probability of an item sort of transacting one zero on an item fixed effect and sort of the price that they were setting for only for the fixed price kind of listing. You get a demand curve, basically. Uh, for auctions, you basically combine two regressions. So one regression is to basically run one zero, did you sell or not for the auction on an item fixed effect and the start price for the auction. Then you have another regression of what is the, for, for only the, the items that transacted in auctions, uh, what's the, the sale price that you got on an item fixed effect and the start price of the auction. And then what you do, you, you basically take like, think of the S is like the start price for the auction and then for every point in S, now I get like a predicted P and a predicted Q. And now I collect all the, all the, all the points on the QP kind of uh, 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 space and kind of connect them. So that would give me sort of what I, would, I called before like the auction demand curve, which is like in the QP space rather than like the, the start price, which is sort of the way you get the QP uh, that you want uh, in the data. Uh, I should say, like much more, this, the auction part is going to be much kind of, much more precise, so like much more variation on the start price kind of, as you might expect, there might be much more variation on the start price across auctions of the same stuff. So there's less variation kind of on, on the fixed price listing. So, so, so the range of kind of, of where we can get the demand curve accurately is not as, is not as large for the, for the fixed price. Um, so let me just finish with, with a few pictures. As I said, sort of the, this is in, and then three for the posted price, this is just kind of, we do it like by category. So, so think of this non-parametric demand curves. So the, the purple curve, this is like the demand curve for, for, for an average fixed price item uh, in 2003. This is sort of the implied auction demand curve uh, in, in, in 2003. I guess you see roughly, if you really try hard, it, it has the qualitative sort of prediction of the model that sort of the auction demand curve is kind of flatter. Uh, not as steep as the, as, the, as the regular kind of demand or fixed price demand curve. But in general, you see that sort of the auction demand curve is almost everywhere above the, so, so in, the, in the QP space, you, it's almost always on average, ex ante better for you to actually go for an auction because you're getting kind of better bang for the buck. Uh, if you do the same exercise in 2009, both of them are shifting in, but the, the auction demand curve is shifting much more in so okay, at this point, like the, the, the fixed price demand curve is becoming actually much more relevant kind of or, or better for you, at least for, for, for in, this, in, in, in most of the range. And only when you really want to hit kind of high probability of sale, uh, it's, it's kind of the auction demand curve becomes uh, better. Then moving to the next one. So now what I do is it's the, 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 the purple lines are the, same, are the same curves from before, the, the 03 fixed price demand curve and the 09 fixed price demand curve. So you see the shifting in. Now the, the, the blue lines are, are not the, the, they're not the auction demand curve anymore. Now they are the auction sales curve, which are basically the probability of sale against the start price of the auction, which kind of is, is, the, is this third kind of curve that I showed you in the, in the, in the little theory kind of uh, 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 graph. And why do I do this? Because then, I can calibrate sort of the, the lambda based on this vertical difference between the, the, the fixed price demand curve and the auction demand curve. And what you see that sort of the implied lambda here is about 7% in 03 in terms of the relative value relative to the value of an average item. And it moved up to like 16% uh, in 2009. And, and you can get the U difference or the change in U uh, 
uh, which is as just the, the, just the overall shift in the, in this in this uh, in this in the, in the fixed price demand curves, you get it about to, to be 14 percent. So, to what extent changes in U versus changes in lambda explain sort of the expected profit that kind of a, a seller on eBay can make on average? Let me skip the the notation. Uh, so you plug in the numbers from the graph that I showed you, and you get basically that that you know an effect of lambda is changing sort of sellers' relative incentive to fix to to list as fixed prices by four percent. The, the implied change in U is changing kind of relative incentive to list as fixed prices at one percent. So so it's kind of a four to one ratio on average of of how important lambda is relative uh, to U, which again lambda is kind of the relative decline in demand for auctions. So it's just kind of more intense online competition overall, something like that. Then the two final thing I want to show, uh, one is like, the, like big heterogeneity across categories. So what we did, so we classified all these 40 categories on eBay based on some sort of, you know, principal component analysis to be sort of, you know, more commodity categories versus less commodity categories. So if you think like appliances and phones are the most commodity ones and like clothing and, and collectibles are the less commodity ones with the caveat that our entire strategy is, is building off kind of duplicate listing. So even in the closing and the, and the collectibles, I'm really comparing sort of semi-commoditized kind of items because I need to have like this multiple items listed. So, but, but, but I'm comparing now the top five versus the, the bottom five, you know, categories in terms of, you know, how commoditized uh, they are. This one is for the, for the idiosyncratic, for the, collecti for the collectibles and three other ones. And what you see here that this is the, the, the posted price all three versus the posted price all nine. So you see kind of much more of a, of, a, of a shift of the auction. So auction is kind of really going down. The auction demand curve is really going down. Posted price is going down a little bit. Uh, if you go to the commoditized categories, you see a very different story. You see basically both curves are kind of shifting down. So, so moving from the, from the solid to the, to the dashed over time. Both curves are more or less par in a parallel way are shifting down. So this is much more of a story of, of, of a lambda difference. So the relative demand for auction relative to fixed price is changing over time. But sort of U, which is kind of captured by the difference between the, the, the two purple lines, is, is not very big. While here, basically, lambda is not that different. But it's actually the, the, the U is kind of driving the entire effect. Which can, in some level, you know, it's kind of what you might expect, kind of given the type of categories that, 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 that we are thinking about. Uh, again, you, and then you can run the same, the same kind of quantitative exercise and say that by, basically in these idiosyncratic categories, lambda is almost everything. Um, but in the, in, the, in the commodity categories, basically the, 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 the two effects are kind of much more similar. I should mention that sort of, you, the delta lambda and delta U are very different, but lambda is affecting one, the auction demand curve, and not at all kind of the fixed price demand curve. U is affecting both of them. So once you translate them to kind of seller incentives, they are not, they are not you know, they are not kind of one-to-one, -one you know, so moving from, from these two numbers to, to this. The final point, I'm going to skip this. Let me just say one thing that it's highly, in, you know, it's highly indirect. Everything we show you is basically here like a, here like a, a 10 year kind of time series. And let us use this kind of type of indirect evidence to say it's kind of much more of a this state for auction for auction that moved, but 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 it's coming from all this very indirect evidence. Uh, what we did kind of in the last year and a half, we we finally got kind of approval from eBay to run some sort of a small scale survey on on, on eBay sellers that were operative uh, on on the platform going back to the early days, and without telling you much the new version of the paper would have the full kind of appendix of all the responses it was like surprisingly consistent with our mostly mo with our narrative like you know just to to buy or just want to buy it at a good price and be done today and customers don't want to wait for the auction to end they want you know all this stuff about explaining why there was like a shift kind of, of that. so all, a lot of the storytelling from the from the seller perspective was about buyers basically so, some version of a lambda story of, of kind of buyers are kind of they didn't mind the auction stuff in the beginning so much, but today they really just come in, they want to get stuff and be done. And, and it was remarkably consistent across, across many of the, of, of the responses that, that we got. Uh, what our takeaway is 
Internet that made auction and related dynamic pricing mechanism or from, from a transaction cost perspective. There are like lots of stuff early on in the late 90s, early 2000s, how internet is going to completely change kind of the way retail is being done because now we can customize the deal to the particular buyer and seller and, and granular time and, and, and we can get all these sophisticated pricing strategies. If you go to the internet today, you just basically mostly, including eBay, you just get a big shopping mall. Uh, and it's not only on eBay. You see it, you know, if you go pro Prosper, which is like a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, they started with this kind of, you know, discriminatory auction kind of mechanism to, to fund loans. And then kind of after several years that they more or less got comfortable with knowing how to price this stuff, they switched to kind of basically a fixed price type of loan, you know, for this type of buyer, for this type of loan, this is the rate you should get and, you know, take it or leave it type of strategy. So, so, so you see this type of, you know, qualitative shift across many other online marketplaces. And, and, and at some level, it must be some sort of a, 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 a a trade-off between the convenience of the transaction and the speed of the transaction and, and sort of, you know, how, how much money is left on the table but not going with the, some sort of a first best mechanism. And it seems that in the case of, this in the case of, of e-commerce, it, it seems like the convenience is kind of winning out kind of over time. All right, I'm out of time. Thanks. Um, so thanks so much for uh, the opportunity to discuss this paper. Um, so this is a, a, a really nice paper talking about uh, auctions versus fixed prices, thinking about you know, how do things get sold, what's the right uh, format, and what are the incentives driving that, that format. And the, and the motivation is uh, on, on eBay, there's been this sort of shift away from auctions into fixed prices. And so I was a little bit uh, 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 young when, when eBay started really roaring back in the late 90s and early 2000s. So I went back on the internet and pulled up some old, uh, 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 some old sort of stories about this. Uh, this is a story from the, the Telegraph of a woman who, who says she should start the eBay Aholics Anonymous group uh, because this, uh, this site sort of soaks up her life. She can't uh, do anything except uh, uh, pay attention to these auctions on eBay. Um, there was a, a, a blog post uh, back in 1999 uh, called Confessions of an eBay Addict. Uh, this is funny. So it's hard to believe it's only been six months since I met my, my great love. I refer, of course, to eBay, the online auction site that boasts like 700 billion buyers and sellers. It's a drug. I'm addicted. I waste hours, entire sunny afternoons sitting there, clicking and searching and browsing. Whatever pops into my head, I type into the search bar, and someone's likely to be selling it. So people were pretty addicted to this eBay uh, uh, phenomena, uh, but it, it didn't last. So Time Magazine back in February sort of comes out with this sort of uh, funny little uh, uh, story talking about the rise and fall of eBay. Uh, and sort of jokes of all the people that I was just referring to, and that's how I found those links. Is, is that, you know, really this, this sort of phenomena of really uh, getting excited about the auction and people driving into these auctions has really, really gone away. And so the, this paper tries to get at, at why is that? And as Laurent mentioned, there's sort of three discussions or three potential rationales that are considered. The first is thinking about differences in composition of what's being sold. This is, I think, uh, uh, everybody's sort of, at least my prior, as was, was Laurent's, that just the type of things that are being sold have changed. The second is this increased competition idea. There's more sellers, so there's uh, fewer uh, opportunities to sort of get the rents out of an auction structure. Uh, uh, that's another story. And then another story is just changing preferences. People uh, don't like au auctions aren't fun anymore is, is, a, is, is how this story goes. And so um, the, as, as Laurent mentioned, the paper argues that the compositional shift is, is unlikely. Um, and this is because all of the shift is actually occurring within category by seller group. So take the same seller selling the same product over time. They're choosing to switch the format in a way that follows the uh, uh, the time series patterns. Um, you, you could ar uh, you know, argue that some of these sort of concerns about are they matching the same products uh, 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 exactly? And, and I, I think you know, if you, as you really start to, to to think about this, these concerns aren't that uh, 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 aren't all that worrying, um, but is potentially an issue. I mean, and when you look at those cohort results showing those uh, those convergences, it was at least uh, convincing to me. Uh, so that leaves these remaining uh, explanations: increased competition and a lower preference for for auctions. And, and what's particularly nice about the paper is that uh, there's a graph that can explain uh, uh, these, these phenomena. And so this uh, is, is the graph Laurent was, was, was showing you, talking about the, the probability of sale on the horizontal axis. So this is sort of uh, the demand. This is how likely you would, would actually be able to sell the product. And this is the price you would be able to, to sell it at. Uh, there's the standard demand curve uh, sloping down here in, in blue. Uh, but if you sell it through an auction framework, people don't like auctions by this factor of lambda. And so you have a different uh, auction sale curve. But the advantage of an auction is that you get to not sell it at the price you post it at. You get to sell it at the price you end up selling it on the auction, uh, which may be, uh, uh, which may actually be higher. And so, if you are willing to look for kind of a low probability of sale, then you might want to go after an auction, as Laurent was saying. If you have a low, if you're willing to kind of, uh, if you really want to 
uh, sorry, if you want to go for a low probability sale and get a high price, you go for the fixed price. If you want to take a high probability of sale, uh, you may want to just go for the auction and try to get some of those, some of those rents. And so the paper is then about trying to estimate this, this graph. And, and so we exploit these uh, variation within these matched pairs of, of products. So you take the same product being sold by the same seller at different prices and different formats. And so you, you, uh, these, these things get uh, uh, linked, to, uh, linked together and exploits these variations in prices and in reserve prices in the auctions uh, uh, to try to get at uh, some of this, the, uh, these demand curves. Now, the variation is occurring over time. So you know, within a year, they're exploiting sort of you know, prices being posted at different times. So maybe there's some kinds of concerns about uh, uh, some time varying and observable problems going on inside those uh, uh, demand curves, uh, sorry, inside that price variation. You might also uh, uh, kind of just wonder you know, what is driving people to change these prices over time. Um, but at the end of the day, I think I do agree with Laurent that the, the results seem to be pretty convincing that they're identifying a demand curve, that these sellers that are coming in don't know exactly how to price these things. They're experimenting, and they're, they're uh, 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 leading us to be able to get a, get a demand curve. And so as Laurent showed, this is from 2003, this demand curve. And, and back in 2003, kind of fits with the, the story. It was better to do an auction than a, than a posted price in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of settings. But you contrast that with 2009, where really you, you're looking at uh, a higher value of doing the auction instead of the fixed price. And so we put, put it all together, as is quite, uh, 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 quite nice and, uh, and a common feature of, of Laurent's papers. We can actually go back, think about that model, uh, and try to get the parameters out of the model uh, from the, the data. And so what this uh, uh, showed you is back in, in 2003, the difference in the uh, in, uh, occur, uh, the probability, uh, sorry, the price that you can get out of an auction versus a uh, an auction versus a fixed price was about uh, 7.6 uh, uh, percentage points, and the difference back uh, in 2009 uh, uh, is much uh, is much larger, at about 16 percentage points. And so the uh, kind of dis, uh, dislike for an auction has increased in this kind uh, of interpretation, uh, and also just the general level of demand has fallen. So that was that change in U uh, by about 14 percentage points. And what, uh, what Laurent sort of uh, uh, pushed through pretty quickly on, but I think is actually one of the nicer features of the paper, is that this is sort of, you know, this, this is identified sort of out of equilibrium in some sense. People are experimenting with different prices and we're trying to learn something about demand. Uh, what's then uh, uh, nice is we want to try to now say, okay, well, how does this shift talk about changes in incentives? And so what he does is he says, okay, well, now let's actually take the model a little bit more seriously, do maximization. And, and think about what the difference in profits are for these, different, these two different uh, 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 choice of, of formats. And so you can use the envelope theorem to characterize the difference in profits that you'd get uh, in the fixed price versus the auction format as you change lambda, uh, where that's just going to depend, on, that only affects the, the uh, amount that you get in an auction format. And so that's just going to depend on the probability of sale in an auction format. Uh, but you can do the same thing if you imagine the whole demand curve uh, uh, is shifting down for both products, that's going to affect the, 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 fixed, the profitability of a fixed price versus an auction format in proportion to the difference in the probability of sale in the two formats, which is uh, this, this 0.08 figure. And so pulling it all together, you get to those percentages that uh, uh, Laurent was showing you that you get about a 4 to 1 ratio uh, uh, that can be explained by the drop in lambda relative to the change in, in U. So although there's lower demand, it's, which would suggest, geez, maybe an auction wouldn't be as big, what's really driving the, the, the difference is really a, uh, an increase in this, in this lambda. Okay, so <clears throat> I think this is, a, this is a really nice paper. I think it fits into the, the spirit of the, the program really nicely. Um, this is the point where I'm supposed to sort of say, uh, 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 you know, quibble with the paper a little bit. So I'll give you some minor quibbles and then one uh, uh, more uh, 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 semi-unfair, but, but maybe uh, 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 sort of more productive comment. So some minor quibbles. So there's maybe some potential current uh, concerns uh, uh, on compositional shifts over time. So uh, uh, we might, might see even the same skew of a product, but you might worry on eBay that maybe there is some kind of unobserved uh, quality that's sort of difficult to to pick up, but somehow the consumers are, are actually picking up when they see different prices. Um, you might also uh, worry that the, the identification of you, and Laurent actually knows this, the, uh, uh, and, and they refer to this in, in the paper, but the difference, uh, there's a difference in the identification of you relative to lambda. So lambda is identified within product. Uh, the difference in you, the levels of the demand curves, is comparing sort of the average product sold in 2003 relative to the average product sold in 2009. And so there's a compositional shift component that's entered into the, diff the estimation of the level uh, of U. The reason I don't worry too much about this is I think that, if anything, a correction for this would actually decrease the drop in U and probably is going to increase more the sort of idea that lambda is what's driving the shift to the, uh, to the, uh, away from the auction format, but is a thing to potentially be concerned about. Um, and then the other thing that wasn't entirely clear to me is, is whether or not the kind of notion of quantity 
is, is sort of the, the right notion of, of quantity. So we're thinking of uh, uh, sort of the probability of sale. Um, I had a little bit of trouble thinking about exactly like is that the right sort of uh, uh, definition of quantity and is, in particular is it one that is uh, uh, consistent across formats. So in the auction format and maybe I have uh, 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 sort of a different way of thinking about uh, how much I'm selling relative to the fixed price format and should I, should I worry about that. Okay. Um, so those are sort of mine, minor quibbles. I, I think I kind of agree with the, the general interpretation of the paper that, you know, at the end of the day, the, 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 the paper uh, says, why did auctions decline? And, and the answer is, well, people don't like auctions anymore. And so in the face of it, I think we can sort of say, okay, well, that's a, a, reasonable, uh, a, a reasonable conclusion, especially given the empirical analysis. But to sort of put it back, you know, to, this is where the unfair comments come back. But now, you know, since we're at a, a price theory comment, I figure I should go find a quote from Degas Dibbis. Uh, so Becker and, and, and Stigler write that, you know, the, the, uh, sort of confront this issue. You know, in a lot of settings, we can find changes in demand, you know, changes in demand, changes in what happens. And, and we could just sort of say, well, geez, this is just a change in preferences. Uh, but this is sort of not uh, 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 sort of the spirit of what, uh, 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 of what uh, 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 Becker and Stegler argue. They say, you know, our preferred interpretation is that one never reaches this impasse where you sort of just say, okay, well, it's just a difference in preferences. So what's going on? Uh, uh, we want to continue to search for the difference in prices or incomes to explain some of these, these changes in, in, in behavior. Uh, and sort of the related issue, and I think this paper is very clear about this issue, that they're estimating residual demand. They're not estimating sort of a primitive of the, uh, of the utility function. Um, but there, it, really, it sort of raises the question, you know, what, what killed the residual demand for, for, these, for these auctions? Is it tastes? Is it incentives? Uh, you know, what do we want to think about there? Uh, so, one thought on, in this direction, which is actually related to some stuff that they do in the last section of the, uh, uh, of the paper uh, as well, is to think about you know, what is driving uh, um, um, this sort of uh, uh, you know, reduction in lambda. Uh, and there's an extension in the paper that I actually think that, that is discussed very briefly that I actually really, really like and I think can kind of fit this, uh, uh, at least this intuition I have, is that there's a lot of people that just sort of like to, to search on the internet and kind of semi-enjoy it. Um, and back in, in, in 2000, you know, if you were just sort of a deal seeker and you enjoyed just, you know, wasting your time when you weren't working, sort of surfing, uh, uh, you, would, you would sort of come across eBay and you could just sort of, you know, as that woman was describing, just waste your time searching for endless things that, that you might be able to buy. Over the course of the last few uh, uh, years, the last decade, there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of other sites that have sort of come online, right? That allow you to uh, find, find deals, a lot of sort of competition for that type uh, uh, of consumer who has sort of, you know, for a range of other reasons, have a different value of time than other consumer that might prefer just buying the product now at a fixed price. Um, and so I think this, this model that they, they uh, loosely sketch in the last section sort of thinks, well, geez, maybe if there's different types of consumers that have different sort of values of time, you can uh, both motivate a, 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 a mixed sort of uh, mixing strategy over time where why, you know, one question that the paper doesn't fully address is why do we see both prices and auctions for the same product from the same seller uh, over time? That's a very weird phenomenon, right? You'd kind of think these things would, one, one would win out. And yet we're not seeing very strong convergence uh, to a particular format, which suggests there's an underlying uh, heterogeneity going on in the population where, geez, this experimentation should actually be optimal. And so one thought is to actually think of, uh, of using a model where you have these different types of, of people operating in the background where you could microfound the price experimentation and maybe even use the optimality conditions of the, uh, uh, you know, how often are they using auctions relative to fixed prices, at what prices are they using to sell it, to try to identify that, something about that latent distribution of types um, and then do that separately over time and try to understand does the changing distribution of types operating in the background align with what we might think of are the changes in the competitive landscape for different types of people. And so that's sort of the, uh, uh, the, the, the main sort of uh, a comment that I would have. You could even do this within categories. So you'd expect, you know, the model makes very sharp predictions for how uh, the evolution of an optimal experimentation would occur in settings where the auction demand curve is above the fixed price uh, uh, curve uh, and vice versa. So that's the, the main comment. So I, I think this is a great, great paper. It's got a nice, I, you know, very clean link between the theory and empirics. Um, but the main comment I have is thinking about pushing more towards the, uh, uh, the micro foundation. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, but um, uh, the, the, the notion of, of price theory, at least the, the way I think of it, and I think the way we think of it here, is primarily a, a belief in microeconomic principles as the primary engine for understanding economic behavior. And so the question is, you know, what are those principles? And I, I usually think of them in terms of three. The first principle is maximizing behavior. 
So we write down models where people maximize, and you know, sometimes they'll maximize goofy things, but they're always maximizing. That's the basic idea. Uh, the second is the notion of equilibrium. Just as you have in physical sciences, there's always a concept that there, you have to grind out what's the equilibrium, and a well-defined model, well-worked-through model, always has an equilibrium. And that's been a feature, by the way, of the of papers of this conference. If you think about it, every paper has an if not explicit, at least implicit in it, some notion of equilibrium, and many of them actually have, have been in explicit. And then the third is the notion of efficiency. That's a little bit less emphasized, I would say, but it's an important one. And, and the reason that we think about efficiency is, is the following, that, that if you think about efficiency, you get an equilibrium that's inefficient, and it forces you immediately to ask the question, well, if, if it's inefficient, that somehow that means there's money left on the table somewhere. Implicitly, there's some, a trade that could take place that hasn't taken place. And so it pushes you to think, what would markets do to address that situation? Is there an institution or a market uh, that would, would be created to deal with that. And so, so I always like that. I think that's an important uh, aspect of price theory that's somewhat of a defect actually in modern game theory. One of the issues that I think in modern game theory is you write down a game, it captures what we think of as a realistic process. And you say, yeah, this sounds like what people are doing. And then you grind the thing out and you say, hey, you know, there's a, there's, you get an inefficient equilibrium here and there's room for you know, something the government could do to make things better. And what I think you, you tend to ignore when you write down these games is that you may, ha you may have made an implicit assumption that's ruled out a particular kind of trade, even though it seems realistic, going the next step and saying, all right, what could you do to, to undo that, I think is an important aspect. And that, to me, is what price theory does. It really relies on these, um, on these three characteristics. So, you know, I always think, this is Becker Friedman, and I always think of Becker as being the quintessential behavioral economist. There was no one who thought more about behavioral non-standard issues than Gary. Uh, but he did it in this very microeconomic way. He used these principles. These were the, the fundamentals of his work. And it is somewhat different, I think, from what we think of as kind of the more modern, uh, maybe not modern, but the psychological behavioral way. So, so go through those three things and ask, well, you know, when we think of behavioral economics, we think of these guys as maximizing, probably not. I mean, I've had discussions with Kahneman about that. In fact, that's the essence of what he believes. He says not only, did he's get, not only is utility theory not a tautology, it's wrong. People don't maximize utility. So he basically uh, rejects that. Second, there, there is no important notion of equilibrium. Part of it is when you're doing psychology, you're thinking of it at the individual level, not at a markets level, so there's no reason really to think about equilibrium. But that's, that's important, and I think it, it sometimes leads one astray. And efficiency, uh, I think, would be the, you know, the same thing. If you sort of thought about the behavioral stuff, people wouldn't worry about inefficiency. In fact, that's a feature uh, in, in a lot of those uh, models. I think that is kind of an interesting, good thing uh, about those things. So, so I think there is quite a distinction. Again, you know, obviously having grown up in Chicago and, and uh, learned price theory as a, as a kid, uh, that's kind of the way I think about the world. It's, a, it's an important way of disciplining the way you do research, and that's the advantage of it. it it's that it, you know, the rules are very well specified. You can't sort of make things up to, uh, well, people are pretty clever, so you can make things up, but um, not supposed to, okay? You're supposed to stick to the rules, and I think as a result, uh, the theory builds more easily on itself. Okay, so that's what I want to say about that. Let me just make one comment on, on Laurent's paper, and then I'll open it up to the floor. Um, I, I actually had thought about this uh, same issue that Laurent and co-authors are thinking about now. I thought about it. I wrote a paper back in, in uh, 2003, um, uh, but uh, it wasn't such a great paper, to be honest. But it had some of the same ideas. And, and the one that I, that I focused on there was actually called the dominance of retail stores. And so the idea was kind of the same. It was why do we see most things being sold uh, in retail stores with a fixed price rather than seeing an auction for, you know, for everything. Why don't we auction out those donuts out there today instead of, you know, pricing them, in this case, at zero for us. Um, and, and, and the issue that, that I was focusing on there, again, since I'm a much older guy uh, and grew up in a different time, uh, when I was an undergraduate, people used to talk about uh, Walrasian auctioneers, and there was a notion that that people discuss then called false trading. Avinash might have heard that too because he's about my vintage. Um, and uh, false trading was the idea that if you have an auction, sometimes you don't 
get the thing that you want. So the idea would be the following. Suppose you auctioned off, you want to buy some milk, okay? So you go into a grocery store and we're going to have an auction for that container of milk, all right? Now the problem is you don't know until the end of the day when the auction closes whether you got the milk. So you need milk and the question is, you know, do you go to another store and then bid on another carton of milk? You know, you might end up with two cartons, you might end up with one carton, you might end up with zero. So that's called false trading in the old literature. And the idea there is that, you know, that's an inefficiency, but it does elicit the, uh, uh, does elicit the information, just as it does in, in Laurent's paper. So you get better information, uh, you get efficiency in the sense of an English auction always gives the good to the right person in the sense of the person who values it the highest, but it has this time cost associated with it, which is the, the point that Nat uh, uh, mentioned as well. Uh, and so if you think about it that way, you do get some of the same impl implications, but again, you get this notion of, you know, if it's perishable good, chances are you're not going to have an auction for it, and particularly one that's off in the distant future. It also gives you the same implication about um, thinking in terms of, are, are there thin markets, are these homogeneous goods, what's the value of the information that you get? If it's a competitive market and you know the price of milk, you know what the equilibrium price is going to be, there's not a, lot of, a whole lot of value to having that auction. And so that was a, a slightly different way of thinking about it, but I, I've already sent it on the paper and I, I just thought I'd emphasize that because it does go back to a literature that even predates my undergraduate school. So uh, thanks. Let me open it up for discussion. So comments? Kevin. Yeah, I just just one, and I, I, I did enjoy the paper quite a bit, and I guess in, in keeping with the price theory theme, in keeping with uh, Nathaniel's comments at the end, I think getting behind the demand side, because there's an analogous exercise you could do. You sort of laid out the thinking of sellers and why they might do A versus B, along the lines of what Eddie said and what was said previously. There's a corresponding picture on the demand side. And competition and the other alternatives are relevant in the market, even without bringing in different types of buyers. It's just like, what, what, what does the rest of the world look like? But that's an important part I always think of as price theory is we want to get as much as we can out of the preference part of the problem and into the constraints and market interactions part of the problem where they become much more measurable and understandable. They, they become things that we can, we can touch. Whereas if you say, well, it's just all in my head, well, the fact that it, you know, even if it's not changing, it's something that we can't really understand as, as clearly. And I think that would be the great next step with this paper would be to say, okay, how do I do something similar for buyers? It's a little more complicated because the buyers, you don't see as much of their world as you do maybe from the sellers, where you see whether the product's sold or not. You see a very simple environment. You don't know if this guy's shopping on eBay and shopping on someplace else at the same time or is looking at 12 different auctions. It's a little more common. But you could do some things along those lines about you know, how likely you are to get a product, how quickly, things like that, how thick the markets are. Because the one thing that struck me is that that shift likely has a lot to do with these other things, not just taste. And that fits price theory as well. So that was my major comment. So I had a few quite, uh, comments first. I couldn't quite tell how size matter. In other words, even if you have a uniform distribution, but I only have two guys, the variance is going to be a lot each day. So the variance of getting the product, that, as well as the variance of getting stuck with the product. And like I say, this is an old question, actually. When you think about it, say, Eddie mentioned department stores. So you used to have bazaars. And then they emerged, and, and you now have uh, you know, a different environment than department stores. And department stores are interesting because you can't negotiate on the low items, but the higher up you speak, the floor you went through got more expensive and quick negotiate. So I always thought it was kind of interesting to see that transition. And in fact, your trend, what you're focusing on is the buyers, they enjoy an auction, it's a pain in the net. There are a lot of business, to, and you know, maybe that has to do with taste or something, but there are a lot of environments in which you have business to business transactions. And the good was sold initially, say, an input um, by auction. And then over time, it evolves into, say, fixed, to fixed price. So why? So the things you were talking about, the probability of making a sale matters to the demander, but so doesn't the not incurring the inventory costs uh, on the selling side. And the notion in an arrow the Burr model that the probability of sale matters is something that doesn't exist. So that's what you're, you're really talking about. So you can build that into your model. And 
I've done, I'll send you some stuff on it and some references on that, but um, I always thought that was a fascinating, fascinating enough research that I spent a lot of time in my early life worrying about those problems. And um, uh, I think, uh, if uh, just to end, the existence of organized exchanges, which matters in financial exchange, is really the same, pro or very closely related to the problem you're looking at, so it's really a good, good problem. Really like what you've done. I like your uh, kind of broadening of uh, price theory beyond what uh, Glenn was saying yesterday quite a bit. In fact, I'd like to broaden it maybe a little bit even more. Uh, take your two categories of maximization and equilibrium, where broadening them might be choice and interaction. Individuals are making choices. Sometimes, at least in some cases, although some behavioral economists push it too far, uh, people don't succeed in maximizing for one reason or another. And same way, they're always <coughs> interacting with each other. It might not settle down to equilibrium. We want to keep maximization and equilibrium as kind of uh, starting points for thinking. And maybe we need in practice to broaden them both out a little bit. Uh, same kind of way with efficiency. Uh, actually, there are certain ways of doing game theory that I think uh, close to what you want, and the person in that context might be Tom Shelley. He's always asking, this is what I would like to get. How can I structure the game? How can I uh, find ways of making threats and promises credible, etc., etc., that will get me what I want? And another addition to that, uh, of course, would be um, course. Uh, and all the things that followed from that, if uh, the structure of institutions and transaction costs are such that money is being left on the table, can we devise other institutions, other organizations, etc., that will allow us to pick it up for uh, uh, private law, etc., etc.? Uh, so, uh, on the one hand, uh, price theory can be much more broad than even uh, Ed suggested. On the other hand, Glenn has a different view, I think. It's the way in which you do these things, uh, the way you simplify the thinking, analysis, etc., etc., to the point that it becomes more transparent, uh, easier to handle, <coughs> well, which also has value. And I think I'll say a little bit more about that in uh, my discussion this afternoon. Great, thank you. Matt? Yeah, just one other thought further on. This is something I'm sure you guys have thought about, but it wasn't in the, in the talk, is changes over time in information for buyers and sellers and uncertainty. So actually, like as a, a another big impact that eBay has on the world is it's much easier if, if, you don't, if you wonder what is the value of a 1950 stamp of this particular kind. A really good way to figure it out is look on eBay. So I think we would expect that because of that, because of Amazon, lots of things, the uncertainty that buyers and sellers both face about valuations has gone way down. One, one particular way I would think that that could show up that's related to the pattern we see is precisely because of what's in, in, in your model. In the early days, if I'm a buyer with kind of uncertainty about the valuations and I see a seller with a fixed price, that seller is kind of very adversely selected in the sense that they're probably setting a very high price relative to the, the range of prices because that, that comes out of your model endogenously. So in the early days, as a buyer on eBay, fixed price sellers are rare. And if I see somebody selling for a fixed price, they're probably somebody who has a very high reservation price and wants to, to, to sell for a high price. So that, the, the selection of who's going to be doing fixed prices is changing over time as a function of that information. Maybe, I don't know which, which way that goes, but it seems like another micro foundation behind the demand changes. Yes, uh, I was uh, wanting to come to your, uh, or question your, your statement about efficiency. Are you talking about uh, economic efficiency being equal to physical efficiency? Is Severin is here, oh, there he is here about efficiency in electrical generation. It's a physical oh. thing. And then uh, like efficiency in, in the marketplace may not cause the energy to produce at the most efficient point. Yeah, no, so I, I was, I meant, Econom I meant efficiency in terms of... Which is not equal to physical efficiency. Correct, yeah. And the other thing is, can one have efficiency in non-competitive markets? Because the definition of an efficient market is... Uh, 
is a, a yeah. competitive. I mean, market. well, that, that's in the next paper. I mean, I mean, well, that was the argument: is that if you have a quote non-competitive market, then the issue is, what are the incentives to remedy that? And so that's why I like always saying, well, if it's inefficient, take the next step. So I, I kind of agree with Avinash on this. I mean, it's like good game theory does that. It says, wait a minute, I got something that is kind of surprising to me, and so I want to think harder and take the next step. And I guess that would be my answer on this. Let me, let me move no, on I, from that. I, I think we're Kevin, go ahead. out of time. Yeah. No, no, we, we, can take another, we can talk. take another five minutes. Go ahead. We're no, okay. We've got plenty of time. In one the question I had is, and this is kind of following on what Matt was saying as well, which is if you look within products as they get thicker or thinner, or if they've been around longer or shorter, how does that lay out in your model? I mean, you could do a decomposition. You did a kind of like a product level decomposition. You could think about like a life cycle decomposition or a scaled story. And if there are any products where they got thinner markets over time, did you see them shifting in a different trend because you might think as the thickness of the market changes, the structure would, would change as well. I think your theory would imply that. So I guess that's a good question. Let me just, yeah. I think one, I mean, like a lot of good stuff here that I can just look after, but one thing that came up from Nathan and Kevin's first comment, and it's kind of, at least my response is kind of related kind of to this last comment from Matt and Kevin. Some trade-off, you know, there will be other ways to solve this trade-off, but but like, it, there's probably no, I mean, suppose you try to microphone Lambda, which is, I'm completely on board, I mean, for sure, that's like the obvious next step if we know of a good way to do it. My guess is that the way to do it, or, or, or the true story, whatever this might be, is going to be fairly different across type of, you know, it's related to your last point, like it's going to be fairly different across type of products and, and, and and part of, it, part of it is is this big data problem is that like what's a market? It's not a it's not a book or skew. It's 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 like you know each product is its own, and one could argue that these two things are highly substitute. Other would say like not for me. I wouldn't never kind of buy from this. You know so 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 partly it's just a data problem. Partly it's how to deal with the heterogeneity. So 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 and and sort of we saw the, the the this kind of trade off in like how carefully we can go versus sort of how. I guess general but imprecise since how or less microphone we can go. In in the completely other extreme, like in the paper with Ma Mike who's here, Mike Dinerstein, which at some level I don't like it too much because we, we there we, we, we kind of well we started a different question, but we because we were we really wanted to kind of nail the, the, the story, we, we ended up dealing with with this highly specific, you know, homogeneous good. And then on one hand I feel like we got the right answer. On the other hand, it, it only applies for a single video game. So, 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 so there's a sense in which, yeah, we'd love to explore the spectrum in the frontier along these dimensions, but, but going in between, that gets tricky because sort of, then you are not quite there and not quite there. So, so I think it's, I, but I completely agree with the, with the basic we're, question. We're running short on time, but let me just take the last two. I saw Steve Eddie, there's someone who's had her hand up for a little while. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, but uh, let's go quickly. Steve, seven. Yeah. Let's go. The buy it now option to say something directly about consumer preferences is it's the, the same item. It's effectively a fixed price, and you're giving the consumer the option to say, I don't want to do this auction, I'm just going to buy it now. And if they're differentially over time, say, until the time of the end of the auction, uh, this sort of thing, reflecting that I don't want to do the auction, I'm just going to buy it now, that then you can get around a lot of these things. But I think I would move back towards Glenn's definition in a way that price theory is actually a foundation and a starting point that is violated, that people do act in non-maximizing ways and so forth, but was a reaction to the early part of the 1900s where there was really not a rigorous foundation for how behavior, how people behave, and there were all sorts of sort of not very careful ways of thinking about it. Price theory was a constant pressure to come back to, okay, why aren't people behaving in this way? And I think it has really pushed people like Kahneman and Tversky to be much more rigorous. And well, Kahneman, they were always pretty rigorous, but the behavioral guys to be very rigorous about it. So that I think the real value of price theory and remains not as a religion or as an absolute, but as a foundation that's this constant pressure to ask of all the other non-maximizing behavior, 
You know, we're not convinced because, you know, why isn't this going on? And it has become broader because price discrimination in the 80s, giving a paper here on that, really huge pushback on, oh, no, I can think of a cost basis. And I thought of it as a bit of a game, that if I get to think of a, can think of any plausible cost basis, the discussion's over. And I think we've moved beyond that, but it still provides that really rigorous foundation and pushback towards what otherwise could turn into very sloppy thinking, both within economics and in other social sciences. Um, related to C's point, I was thinking about the idea of the duration of the auction. You yeah, kind of use the starting price as the one control variable that sellers have, but they also set how long the auction goes for. And you would think that to the extent that this lambda is about uncertainty and stuff like that, it may be related to the length of time of the auction and trying to use some of that variation. 